Okay, um, 7.05, so we can get started. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today. My name is Ramya. I am the Citizen Science Coordinator for the Key Biscayne Community Foundation. Um, we have the uh, Key Biscayne Citizen Science, uh, sorry, <laughs> Key Biscayne Citizen Scientist Project um, with which we have a lot of different programs and events throughout the year. Um, one of the things that we do are lectures like this. They're every third Thursday of the month. Um, unfortunately, this year, like everything else, um, our programming got disrupted by COVID. Um, so this is our first lecture back since uh, we stopped back in March. And we're really excited to have you all here. It's our first online lecture. So we're hoping that it will uh, be a success. Um, Today we have with us uh, Leanne Hauptman. She uh, works for Miami-Dade uh, Sea Turtle Conservation Program. Um, her, the title of her talk is uh, Sea Turtles in Society, Our Aquatic Neighbors. And uh, she's gonna tell us all about like the sea turtles, what, um, what their situation is, and uh, what people can do to help um, their endangered status, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, we also have with us Brianna Gibbs. Uh, she also works with me at the foundation and she is going to be our moderator. Um, so she will be um, handling all of the questions and any other logistics. So uh, with that, Bree, I'll give it to you. Yeah, so this video is going to be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, so if you want to rewatch it or miss something because you have to step away from your computer, you can go back and access it at any time. Uh, any questions that you have will be held till the end of the lecture. Um, please, again, keep your video turned off throughout the duration of this talk. We will turn off your video if you do turn it on. Uh, this is just a security thing. So all participants are muted. And so with that, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to our Twitter, which is at KB Citizen Science, or sorry, at KB Sitsai, my bad. Um, or you can email them to Ramya, who will also be helping me in moderating this, which is Ramya at keyscience.org. Um, and if you'd like to sign up for our news and future events and lectures, please send your name and email address again to Ramya at keyscience.org. So with that, take it away, Leanne. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Leanne Hopman. I am the interpretive program leader here at Miami Dade County Sea Turtle Conservation Program. I'm super excited to be part of this lecture series with um, Key Biscayne Citizen Science Project. So, just for you guys to know what we're going to be talking about, I'm going to talk to you about sea turtles kind of what the sea turtle conservation program does here in Miami-Dade County, the most common sea turtles that you find here in Miami-Dade County. And then I'm gonna focus a little bit more on Key Biscayne because um, this is part of the Key Biscayne Citizen Science Project. So I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the history of Key Biscayne, Key Biscayne sea turtles, um, and then also the threats that sea turtles face how you guys can help. And then I'm also gonna leave time at the end of this lecture for some question and answers and discussions. So to get started, what is a sea turtle? So sea turtles are large air breathing reptiles. So what a reptile is, that means that it breathes air, it lays eggs, and it actually um, is cold blooded. So that means that a sea turtle relies on its environment to actually warm its body up. Um, sea turtles inhabit tropical and subtropical waters um, all around the world. Sea turtles come in many different shapes sizes, colors. We have different species. Um, we see different species here in Miami-Dade County. Um, so they all look different, um, but their bodies are actually adapted for life in the water. They have huge, large front flippers, um, but everything about a sea turtle is adapted for water. So everything from its eyes to the way it eats, it's all um, made for the water. So sea turtles actually spend their entire lives in the ocean. The only time a sea turtle is actually gonna come up on land, if it's a nesting female, um, a hatchling that just hatched, or if it's sick or injured. Um, other than that, sea turtles spend their entire lives in the water. So I'm gonna talk about the sea turtle life cycle. It's kind of crazy. It's actually really, really cool. Um, to get started, I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna start talking about the adults. 
So um, what happens is during nesting season, so um, the adults will actually start mating. So there's an environmental cue that actually tells all sea turtles that it's begin to, um, to start mating. So they actually will migrate from wherever they are, foraging, eating, they actually migrate there um, from where they're at to their mating grounds. Um, so once they get to the mating grounds, they'll start mating. And wh where they're mating is actually just off the coast. So wherever they're gonna lay, wherever that female is gonna lay her eggs, she, they're all just right off that coast. So there's a bunch of sea turtles right, right now. It's towards the end of sea turtle season right now. But during sea turtle season, they're all right near our um, coast mating. So what happens is after they mate, the female sea turtle will actually come on to the beach and she usually comes on the beach in the middle of the night um, and she'll actually crawl up the sand so she'll use her really strong large front flippers to drag her body up the sand and she's looking for a suitable place to lay her eggs so like i said sea turtles are reptiles so they lay eggs so she's going to lay her eggs at some area in the sand that she thinks is the best spot for them so what she does is she'll crawl up and she'll, um, once she finds a place that she thinks is the perfect spot to lay her eggs, she'll actually start to create what's called a body pit. So she takes her big body and she kind of moves her um, body in the sand. And then once she's comfortable, she's going to start using her rear flippers and she actually starts digging a hole using her rear flippers only. So that hole is actually going to be what's called an egg chamber. So an egg chamber is it kind of looks like a light bulb shape. It goes down and then kind of curves out. So we call it a light bulb shape. So she's using her rear flippers to dig. Um, depending on species, she can dig anywhere from a foot up to four feet. So it really just depends on how large that turtle is and what species of turtle that is. So when she gets her egg chamber to a certain depth and she likes the way it um, feels to her rear flippers, she's actually gonna start depositing her eggs. Now a sea turtle can deposit anywhere from um, 80 to 180 eggs in one nest. So one nest can have up to 180 sea turtle um, hatchlings in it, which is crazy. So she will actually lay, we've seen um, in sea turtle nests, we've seen as little as 20 eggs and we've seen as much as 200 eggs. Um, but on average, we typically see um, 80 to 180 eggs in one nest. So once she deposits her eggs, she's gonna actually cover them back up. So she uses her rear flippers again to cover um, the eggs with the sand and she kind of pats it down using her rear flippers. And once she gets the sand on, type, on top of the eggs, she's actually gonna start what we call it camouflaging. So she's gonna use her um, front flippers and she's actually gonna throw the sand behind her. And you can see up in this right-hand picture at the top, all that sand that's covering her. So they make a mess when they're, it's called camouflaging. So she's taking that sand and she's placing it over there. So she wants to protect those eggs. She wants to keep them um, covered. She doesn't want any predators to find them. So she wants to make it as natural as possible as the, as the beach. So she's covering them up with sand. Once she's done covering, she'll turn around and she'll go back into the ocean and she never sees her babies again. So sea turtles, when they hatch, they're on their own. So a mama sea turtle just decides, okay, once I, I know they're safe in the ground, she leaves. And that's the last time she'll see her babies. So the little hatchlings are on their own. So once she lays her um, eggs and she returns to the ocean, the eggs will actually be in the sand from anywhere from 45 to 80 days. Now this incubation period, the, the period as um, how fast they're growing is dependent on the sand temperature. So the cooler the sand, the um, slower that process is gonna be. The hotter the sand, the faster that incubation period is gonna be. So that also, there's different things like tides, if they're wash, the tides are washing over the nest, it slows the um, incubation period if it's really, um, rainy that season, it slows the incubation period. Um, also, sand temperature is a dependent of um, if the sea turtle actually becomes male or female. So, which is insane. When I first started um, learning about sea turtles, I had no idea that the sex of the turtle wasn't determined as soon as the eggs were laid. So the sand temperature at one point during the incubation process, depending on how hot that sand temperature is, the pet, that makes the sex of the turtle. So the hotter the sand, the more females you'll get. The cooler the sand, the more males you'll get. 
And then once they are all done growing inside their eggshells, they all hatch at one time. So they all are going to hatch at once and they're going to make their way up. They're kind of crawl over each other. Um, usually this hatch out um, is in the middle of the night. And the cool thing about it is, is they're all coming out at once. So you can see up to 180 hatchlings come out of the water, uh, come out of their egg chamber at once. Um, and they actually, they're, they're tiny, but they're strong. So they can make it through that sand and actually their brothers and sisters are helping them make it up that sand. So it's kind of like an elevator. They're kind of crawling on top of each other, making their way up. So once they get out of that sand, they're all going to crawl to the brightest horizon. So the brightest horizon, and it's, this is in the middle of the night, should be the moon reflecting over the ocean. So they're looking for that brightest horizon and then they're going to start making their way um, to the ocean. And once they hit the ocean, they're going to start swimming, they're going to catch the current, and they're going to find the um, a safe place to um, that's protected and to eat. So I just wanted to show you a couple pictures. So this picture on the right is actually what an egg chamber would look like um, down in the sand. This is a, a, a replica, so this isn't a real one, but this is kind of what we see in the egg chamber. So we have all the eggs and then the hatchlings will make it out, out all at once, and we call this a boil because you have up to 180 babies coming out of the sand at once and it literally looks like the sand is just boiling with sea turtles. So it's a really cool thing to see. So once they make it into the water, they're gonna spend their lives in the water. Um, they're tiny, their hatchlings can be the size of your hand, the palm of your hand. So they have to be protected. So they're gonna find um, seaweed patches, sargassum patches, where they're protected, where they can find food, um, and they're gonna spend that amount of time until they reach a good enough size where predators aren't gonna be much of a problem for them or until they reach maturity. So that can be anywhere from 10 to 30 years, depending on species. Um, but once they reach maturity or that safe size, they're gonna start venturing out into their foraging grounds, into the places that they can find food from. And then they're going to st start that cycle all over again. Once mating season comes, they're all going to migrate into their mating grounds and then we'll restart that nesting process. And that's actually where we come in. So our program um, is with Miami-Dade County. So we're Miami-Dade County Sea Trail Conservation Program. Um, we work um, within the Coastal Division for Miami-Dade County Parks, Recreation and Open Spaces. Um, we do daily nesting surveys um, all summer long. So officially sea turtle season starts May 1st and runs through October 31st, but the dates fluctuate due to biological opinion. So we actually start in April. Um, we do have beach nourishments here in Miami-Dade County. So we start a little bit earlier. Um, so we're surveying the beaches seven days a week, 30 minutes before the sunrise until October 31st. So we're almost at our nesting season right now, but we still have a little bit more to go. Um, we are under a Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission sea turtle, a marine turtle permit. This allows us to do the work with sea turtles because sea turtles are endangered. So that means that it, they are federally protected. So you have to be on an authorized permit to touch, handle, any type of data, anything to do with sea turtles, you have to be on a permit. So our permit holder is Laura Dell. She's fantastic. She um, is our manager here at the sea turtle program. So we are all authorized under her permit. Um, so we're taking a bunch of data when we're out there. We're trying to help as much as we can with the sea turtles. Um, and then we actually take data to send to Florida Fish and Wildlife. And they actually will run population assessments, they'll see what um, they can do for the state of Florida to help sea turtles and change things, change our permit where it needs to be. Um, and we also do research projects. We do have graduate students that are completing their master's degree, so, which is really cool. We get a little bit of research um, in our program as well. So like I said, we start 30 minutes before sunrise. So we are out there in the early mornings all throughout Miami-Dade County. So we're covering 19 miles of beach. We're in Golden Beach, we're in Sunny Isles, Hallover, we're in all of Miami Beach. So Bell Harbor, Surfside, South Beach. We also cover Fisher and then we're in Key Biscayne, Crandon. Um, and so we're taking our UTVs and we're actually looking for sea turtle tracks. Um, occasionally we get lucky and we get to see nesting moms that are finishing up. They're a little bit slower in the process, so we get lucky sometimes when we see them, um, which is a real treat for us, because usually what we're doing is we're just looking for these tracks. 
So that's the main thing that we're looking for when we're going out there um, is the tracks. And what we're doing is we're taking all kinds of data and everything we can about what's going on with the sea turtles in Miami-Dade County. So when we get to see um, sea turtle activity, we're going to take as much data as possible and then we're going to determine if the sea turtle nested or not. So a sea turtle doesn't necessarily have to nest when she comes up. She could either do what's called a false crawl where she comes up and leaves, which is these pictures right here. She comes up, she decides, no way, I'm not nesting here. And then she turns and goes right back into the water. Something either spooked her, she didn't like the beach or she wasn't ready and she just turns around. And that happens occasionally. So it's called a false crawl. But if she does nest, um, we look for those certain indicators that tell us that there are possible eggs in this area of sand. And so what we do is we mark the nest off. So marking nests really help us because we do have beach cleaning here in Miami. It helps protect the sea turtles. It helps people stay away from the sea turtles' um, nests. Um, and it just, uh, the nest actually, if you've been out to the beach, you'll see it's the stakes um, with the orange tape. And every single bar, uh, one of our nests have the do not disturb sea turtle signs on it. So this just tells people that this is a federally protected species. You are not allowed to touch it, mess with it, sea turtles, their nests, anything like that. Um, and you could be subject to fines or imprisonment if you do so. So it just really helps um, just protect them a little bit more. So we also, on top of um, marking the nest, we actually, what we call is excavation. So what we do is after a sea turtle nest hatch, we actually go into the nest and we're going to take out the contents of that nest and we're going to count how many eggs hatched, how many didn't hatch, um, if there's anything crazy going on with that nest, um, we're taking all kinds of data because this is going to be sent to Florida Fish and Wildlife and this is going to help with the population assessments help if there's anything crazy going on and just help with research in the future. So we're taking all this data and sometimes there's little hatchlings that, that get stuck, they don't make it. So we give them a little extra help and we'll take them and we'll release them um, that night. So, so they have the best chance of survival. Um, as you can see here in the left hand picture, you have a mix of eggs. So sea turtle eggs are really funny. They actually look like ping pong balls. They look exactly like a ping pong ball. Depending on species, the larger the species, the larger um, the egg will be. But you can see here in this left hand picture, you have, um, it looks like kind of like scraps of paper. These are actually all the hatched eggs. So you have all these hatched eggs, which means that the sea turtle actually made it out of the egg. The hatchling came out of the um, egg chamber and made it, hopefully made it to the water. Um, but then you can see actually we have here the actual whole eggs. So sometimes sea turtles, when they lay their eggs, they're, they don't get fertilized correctly. Something may have happened to the nest, so they're just not viable. So we make sure that every sea turtle gets out of that um, egg chamber um, and we take data of the ones that aren't viable. And so if you see us with our heads in the sand, we're not crazy. We're just taking data for Florida Fish and Wildlife and making sure that there's no hatchlings left in the sand. So here in Miami-Dade County, we have um, a couple different species that we uh, see nesting um, on our beaches. Now, in the world, there are seven different sea turtle species. Um, but here in Miami, we see five of those species but only three of those five actually nest. So we see um, three different species, which is the loggerhead, the green, and the leatherback sea turtle. So the loggerhead sea turtle actually makes up 90% of our nesting, 90 to 95% of our nesting here in Miami-Dade County. So loggerheads are one of the most common sea turtles we see here in Miami-Dade County. We do get green sea turtles. They make about 5% of our nesting here in Miami-Dade County. Um, and we also do see leatherbacks. Now, leatherbacks here in Miami-Dade County are not that abundant, um, but we do get to see them and we do get nests here, so which is really cool. They make about 1% or less than 1% of our nesting here in Miami-Dade County. Um, I'm actually gonna go through and tell you a little bit about each of the species so you kind of get to know um, each of the most common nesters here in Miami. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is the loggerhead. The loggerhead, again, is our most common nester here in Miami-Dade County. Um, we see them, we have a ton of them here, um, a ton of their nests, they love it here. Um, they typically nest mid-April to early September. Um, they're anywhere from 200 to 400 pounds. 
And one of the things that you know, if you see a sea turtle and you're trying to figure out what species it is, the best thing to look at it for a loggerhead is their head. They have ginormous heads and that's their, their name, the loggerhead. And if you can see in my screen, um, you can see this is a loggerhead skull. So you can just kind of see how big this skull is. I mean, compared to my head, their heads are ginormous. So if you see a sea turtle that has a huge head, it's a loggerhead. Um, and a smaller body, it's a loggerhead. Now their um, diet preference is actually shellfish and crustaceans. So loggerheads have a really, really powerful, powerful jaw, and they're actually going to crunch down on those shells in, in one bite. They have these huge jaws, and they're powerful, and they can crunch through that shell like no problem. So their main diet um, consists of shellfish. The next sea turtle is the green sea turtle. So green sea turtles nest um, mid-May to about September. Um, they are the largest hard-shelled sea turtle. So I know you might be thinking that there's another sea turtle that's larger than them, but they are the largest hard-shell sea turtle. Now I'll explain in the next slide a little bit more as to why they're the largest hard-shell. Um, but they weigh anywhere from 300 to 500 pounds. Um, and we call them large and in charge because they these green sea turtles Turtles, when they come up to nest, they will knock down anything in their way. They will knock down beach chairs. We've seen them rip up a walkway before to nest. So their strong front flippers are going to get through anything. They're, they're on a mission. They're going to lay those eggs no matter what. And another reason we call them large and chars is because their nests, um, when they lay their eggs, they are one of the messiest sea turtles I've seen lay um, their eggs. So it looks like a bomb went off on a beach. Um, so you can see right here where my cursor is, the top left picture, um, you can see that there's a ginormous hole. So this sea turtle, that's her body pit. So that's where her body was. And she just digs like crazy and creates this huge hole in the sand. And she's flinging sand all over the place. So sea turtle nests are big. Um, and we have no idea where the eggs are. They're just very large and they're, they're strong um, sea turtles. Um, now the adult diet for a um, green sea turtle is actually seagrasses and algae. So we call the green sea turtle the vegetarians of the sea because all they eat is any of the green stuff. Um, so if you look at, at my screen, um, you can actually see this is a green sea turtle skull. So they have smaller heads than the loggerhead. Um, and it's really cool because sea tur uh, green sea turtles actually have a serrated jaw. So that actually helps them tear up sea grasses when they're eating it. The next sea turtle, um, the final sea turtle I'm going to talk about is the leatherback sea turtle. Now the leatherback sea turtle is the largest sea turtle species in the world. So I know I told you that the um, green sea turtle was the largest hard shell species. It's because a uh, leatherback uh, sea turtle actually lacks a hard shell. So you can see in the pictures, it kind of shoot, these turtles look like they have a leathery feel to them. It's because they don't have a hard shell like the green or the loggerhead or any other sea turtle species. But they are the largest sea turtle species in the entire world. And it's really cool because we get to see them here nesting in Miami-Dade County. Um, they nest from mid-March to mid-June, so they are one of the earliest sea turtle um, nesters that we see. Um, we actually have seen a uh, leatherback actually nest at the end of February, so they are very early nesters compared to the other two. Um, they're anywhere from 1,200 to 2,000 pounds. They're ginormous. If you ever see a leatherback, it's a sight to see because they're huge. Um, so their adult uh, diet preference is the jellyfish, which is crazy because they are ginormous and all they eat is jellyfish. Um, but this scary picture in the top left corner is actually not scary at all. This is the inside of a uh, leatherback's mouth. And now these spikes are actually kind of like their teeth. It's called papilla. Now papilla is actually just going to help the leatherback sea turtle hold that jellyfish in their mouth so it doesn't slip right out. But the papilla actually also helps with the stinging cells of a jellyfish. So those things aren't scary, it just helps them eat. And the other sea turtles that are found um, in Florida, around Florida, but don't typically nest here are the Hawksbill and the Kemp's Ridley. And I actually have a hawksbill shell. Um, hawksbills are beautiful. They have one of the prettiest shells that I have ever seen. Um, they're gorgeous. So this is a hawksbill shell. Um, 
So hawksbill, typically you'll find them on reefs. Um, Kemp's Ridleys are really cool because they call them the daytime nesters. So if you ever see a um, Kemp's Ridley nest, they're usually nesting during the daytime and they're very wonky. They are very fast nesters, so they're, they're funny. All right, so I'm gonna actually talk about Key Biscayne a little bit more since I am um, joining the Key Biscayne Citizen Science Project. I just wanna talk about Key Biscayne um, and Key Biscayne sea turtle. So Key Biscayne is estimated by oceanographers and geologists to be roughly 4,000 years old. Now Key Biscayne is the southernmost barrier island and it was forged by a hurricane. So the island underwent an ecological transformation as mangrove seeds actually floated ashore and took hold of the western shores. Um, so the mangroves, um, the mangrove dense networks of intertwining roots and branches along with the colonization actually began to stabilize the sand. So all those root, the seeds and with the roots actually helped stabilize that sand. Um, in 1947, the causeway known as Rickenbacker was built and that actually connected Key Biscayne to the mainland of Miami. Um, this opened the floodgates for development in Key Biscayne. Um, Key Biscayne is also known for Bill Baggs State Park and Bill Baggs is also awesome because Bill Baggs has their own sea turtle program and they have their own loggerheads that they um, sea turtles that they um, monitor. So we actually don't, the Miami-Dade County Sea Turtle Conservation Program actually doesn't go into Bill Bags at all. Bill Bags has their own protocol with the park. Um, so that state park actually offers patrons a glimpse of what a more wild and biologically rich Florida would look like. So it's really cool. And if you ever get a chance to go visit Bill Bags, I highly suggest it. It's amazing. Um, their park rangers, their staff are unbelievably sweet and super knowledgeable. So if you get a chance, go check out Bill Bags. So Key Biscayne's development. So in the 1940s, there was nothing on Key Biscayne. Um, it was just an inhabited island. And then fast forward 2000s, you see what Key Biscayne is today. The beautiful village of Key Biscayne, you have Bill Bags. It's um, again, like I said, the southernmost barrier island. It is a really cool ecosystem. And sea turtles have actually been around since the 1940s or maybe before. Um, so talking about Key Biscayne sea turtles, it has been a critical nesting habitat. Um, again, like I said, like 1940s or before, like they've been first spotted in the 1940s. Um, but it wasn't until 1993 that Key Biscayne was brought into Miami-Dade's monitoring program. So the things that we were doing out on the beach weren't going on until 1993 in Key Biscayne. Now actually, Key Biscayne is one of our top beaches for nesting sea turtles. So um, we actually have the highest nesting densities here in Key Biscayne. Um, we also see the most common nester in Key Biscayne is the loggerhead sea turtle. We actually typically don't see the other two sea turtles, the green and the leatherback, nest in Key Biscayne. We actually haven't had a nest of the green or a leatherback since I don't know when. I don't know if we've ever seen one. Um, but usually it's typically the most common sea turtle you see in Key Biscayne is the loggerhead sea turtle. So why do sea turtles choose Key Biscayne? What, what makes Key Biscayne on average have the highest nesting densities? Well, we don't really know. We're not 100% sure as to why that's happening. But we do believe that Key Biscayne does have darker beaches compared to the rest of Miami-Dade County. Um, Key Biscayne also has cleaner beaches. We also believe that maybe there is a reason the sand composition, if Key Biscayne is giving a more natural feel to the sea turtles and they're liking that more um, than the rest of Miami-Dade County. Um, but also remember that sea turtles return to nest in the same geographic area from which they originated. So it's called natal homing. So that means when they hatch, they kind of, there's something that tells them when they're adults to come back to that same area. So maybe um, in the earlier years, in the, like the 1940s, there was an abundance of sea turtles and that's why we still have an abundance today is because of that natal homing. Now, just a little bit of fun facts about your aquatic neighbors that you see in Key Biscayne. So most loggerhead nests um, are on the open beach. It's between the dune and the high tide line. So when loggerheads come up to nests, they're typically not crawling 
higher than mid beach. So they typically are lower towards a high tide line, but in Key Biscayne, it's, we see a good amount of loggerheads nest in the dunes, or they're nesting a little bit further than that mid beach. Um, sometimes this actually is because of beach loss. We do see um, sand erosion on the beaches. So sometimes they have no choice but to nest in the dunes, but we do see loggerheads crawling a little bit more, a little bit higher than normal in Key Biscayne. Now on average, loggerhead females make five nests separated by two week um, intervals every season. So what that means, that means is that a loggerhead sea turtle can nest up to five times in one season. So the same loggerhead turtle will come up, she'll nest, and then she'll go back and two weeks later she can do it again. And she'll do that four more, up to four more times in one season, which is really cool. Um, also, a little fun fact is Key Biscayne has pocket beaches. So pocket beaches are just kind of off to the side. They're really not, they're separated by just an area of like mangroves or heavily vegetated area. And so there's this little area of beach. Um, and we've actually documented sea turtle nesting there this year, which is really cool because pocket beaches, believe it or not, are very, very important to sea turtle nesting. It's very protected. and it's really cool that we found some there. Um, we've actually found them there this year. So it's really cool to, to see um, sea turtles nesting on pocket beaches. Okay, so some of the threats that sea turtle face um, in Key Biscayne. So these actually are for all sea turtles, not just in Key Biscayne, but for all sea turtles in general. But I'm just gonna talk about the ones that we see a little bit more in Key Biscayne. Um, but again, sea turtles face a lot of threats whether they're in Miami, whether up in North Florida, whether they're up on, uh, on the West Coast. Um, so some of the threats that sea turtles face are development, coastal lighting, pollution, predation, boat traffic, fishing nets, um, their lines and hooks, beach furniture, beach erosion. So, and the list goes on and on. Um, and only one in 1,000 sea turtles actually make it to adulthood. So they have to face all these threats before reaching adulthood. So it's really hard for a sea turtle when they're hatchlings to grow up because they're facing so many threats um, and they're endangered. So their population isn't bouncing back as fast as we would want. So just talking about a little bit of the threats in detail, the ones that we see and that are the most harmful here in Miami-Dade County and here in Key Biscayne. So pollution, pollution is huge. Um, we see a lot of plastic on the beaches in the mornings. We are seeing this, um, these pictures were actually taken this season. So we are seeing tons of balloons. We're seeing tons of plastic. We're seeing trash being left behind. We're seeing fishing nets, unfortunately, getting caught with sea turtles. Um, Key Biscayne does a really good job. I do want to shout out Key Biscayne. We are, this is one of our cleanest beaches here in Miami-Dade County. You guys do an amazing job keeping it clean. Fill a bag is an amazing program that keeps the beaches clean as well. So you guys, Key Biscayne residents are doing an amazing job. Um, but, uh, but you can see in the pictures to the left, these, these plastics, these turtles are ingesting and they're getting stuck in. Um, unfortunately, when they're hatchlings, Sea turtles are going to eat anything they can get their little mouths on. So microplastics are huge. We are finding that more sea turtle hatchlings are dying because of ingestion due to microplastics. Um, and when they're juveniles, they're eating jellyfish and plastic bags look like jellyfish. So pollution is a huge problem with sea turtles. So we all need to do our part to clean up our beaches because these little guys can't make it and they're, they're just trying to make their way and grow up, but they have this huge um, barrier to cross when they're eating or they're getting stuck in plastics and trash. Um, and that, another threat is um, predators. Now this is a natural thing. There's predators in the ecosystem, but we do see for sea turtles, we see the raccoon in Key Biscayne is our top predator. So these raccoons really love our sea turtle nests. They are very smart. They have incredible, um, their noses are incredible. So they can find an egg chamber instantly. As soon as that sea turtle lays her nest, those raccoons are digging in there and eating the eggs um, and eating the hatchlings when they come out of the nest. So we actually have a specialized permit to help stop that. So we actually, um, we will make sure, we'll take an extra step and an extra precaution to try and make sure we'll keep the raccoons out and keep the sea turtle eggs safe. Um, but we do see predators like shorebirds, large fish, fire ants, crabs, sharks, 
Um, all these sea turtles face when they're in the water and they're going to the water. So they, they have to make it past once, um, past all these to get to adulthood. So once they're a little bit older and a little bit bigger, they don't, they don't have much of a problem um, with big fish. It's sometimes you'll see a shark going after uh, an adult sea turtle, but for the most part, when they're adult, they're, they don't have as many predators as when they're hatchlings, because when they're hatchlings, they're really tiny. Like I said, they fit in the palm of your hand. So things can just swallow them whole. So they have a lot of predators when they're um, smaller and younger, but as they grow, the predator list gets a little bit less. Um, and also boat strikes. So Miami-Dade County is known for boat traffic. We have a crazy amount of boaters here. It's, it's great. I love the boating community. Um, what we do ask you is you to please be vigilant when you're boating. So even though a sea turtle has a hard shell, so as you can see in my picture, so they have this really hard shell, right? But that doesn't, it, the force of a propeller, the force of a, bro, a boat is actually gonna go right through this hard shell. And unfortunately, a lot of the sea turtle's vital organs are right beneath the hard shell. So if you can kind of see in the, this shell, the spine is right here and the ribs are right here. So unfortunately, for the most part, when a sea turtle gets hit by a boat, it can be fatal. So we just ask, and they are reptiles, so they do breathe air. So they are coming to the surface to take a breath. So we just want to make sure, especially during nesting season, because sea turtles are right off the coast, to be vigilant and be careful. And if you see something that looks like um, a sea turtle or manatees, to slow down and just be aware of your surroundings, because these guys are going to come up and they just they can't withstand that force of a propeller. And the last um, threat I'm going to talk about is light pollution. Now, light pollution is one of our biggest threats here in Miami-Dade County. Um, unfortunately, um, light pollution is one of the reasons why we don't see a lot of our hatchlings make it into the water. Um, so light pollution is misused or misdirected artificial light. So what that means is it's just all this bright white lights that are just shining up and creating sky glow. So you can kind of see down in this picture to the right on the bottom right, um, this is all sky glow. So this was taken in the middle of the night and it, you can pretty much walk the beach without a flashlight because the sky glow is so bad. So how does light pollution harm sea turtles? Well, it harms nesting females because females may come up on the beach and like I said, sea turtles I, everything on a sea turtle is adapted to life in the water. So their eyes are adapted to life in the water. So they're coming on land and they're not actually, they don't see as well as we do. Um, so they actually will come up and if it's too bright or if there's too many lights, they make it confused and we call it a disorientation where they're confused, they don't know where they're going. They're looking for the brightest horizon, which should be the moon reflecting over the ocean. But unfortunately with these bright white lights um, with the cities and the sky glow, they're going the complete wrong direction. So a nesting female may come up on land, she may get confused, she may spend all that extra time and energy and she may not, not lay eggs. Um, and unfortunately with disorientation, sometimes turtles go into the wrong place. So this turtle, unfortunately, was found in Key Biscayne. She was crawling, got confused, didn't know where she was, and she ended up in a pathway, and she didn't have the energy, or she, and she was too confused to make it out. But the good news is, is that we, she was found, and we actually got her back to the water, and she got enough energy to make it back into the water, healthy and safe. But that's just one of the things that we want to show you guys is, unfortunately, this happens a little bit more than um, what people think, uh, the use of bright artificial white lights really, really disrupt nesting females and their nesting process. Now, how uh, light pollution harms sea turtle hatchlings is when a hatchling comes up out of the sand, they are going to the brightest horizon. And unfortunately, that is, they should be going east. But unfortunately, here in Miami, we see them going directly west. And they're going to all those bright white lights. So we find them under beach chairs, we find them in the dunes, we find them behind the dunes in the grass, and um, it's really hard because they get stuck, and if they get stuck there, they can't make their way out, and unfortunately, if we can't find them or um, pedestrians can't find them, then we are 
they end up staying there and they end up dying. So it's really, really crucial, especially when they first hatch to have a really dark beach. Um, so what we are looking for when a sea turtle hatches is all these in this picture, if you can see my cursor, all these lines are the lines of sea turtle hatchlings and they're going directly east into the water. That's what it should look like. But unfortunately here we see the hatchling tracks going every which direction. They are going west, they're going north, they're going south, they're going everywhere but east. And unfortunately we try our best to find every single one of these tracks. But when you have 80 to 180 hatchlings coming out of one nest, it is very, very hard and very difficult. They are so tiny to find them. So we do our best. We stay out there as long as we can. We let people know if you see a hatchling call us, we'll pick it up. But unfortunately, um, due to lighting, we don't, most of the time we don't find them. But there is a way to fix that. So there is something called sea turtle friendly lighting. So sea turtle friendly lighting, um, sea turtles actually can't, they, this kind of lighting, it doesn't bother them. So what that means is sea turtle friendly lighting, we say keep it low, keep it shielded and keep it long. So when we say keep it low, we're saying you don't need these huge lighting posts to light up the entire area. You just need that one um, low po like lighting post to just the area that you're like the walkway. Like it doesn't need to be everywhere up in the sky. We want to keep it low. Um, we want to keep it shielded. So keep it shielded means that we want to keep it directed to the ground. We do not need lighting up in the sky. You do not need to shine a light into the sky. So we want to keep those lights shielded because that directs it down. And with dune systems, that actually creates a barrier so you can't see the lighting past the dune system. So we want to keep it shielded and keep the lights directed to the, um, the ground. Now when I see keep it long, I'm talking about the color of the light. So a long wavelength means that the color of the light is gonna be a red or an orange. Now this is sea turtle friendly. This actually means that sea turtles aren't bothered by it. They can't really see it that well. So we wanna implement um, long wavelengths of light. So we wanna really implement the orange and the reds in our lighting. Now be careful because sometimes if you just slap on a shield that's orange, it might not um, help with that bright white light behind it. So really look up, you can also sea turtle, um, the sea turtle conservancy uh, can actually help you with um, choosing the best light for um, sea turtle friendly. So keep it low, keep it shielded, and keep it long. So that is sea turtle friendly lighting. And if you have any questions about this, you can let us know and we'll help you um, figure out what the best lighting is for your property. Um, especially with code enforcement, you can ask them and they can talk to you about it. So what are some ways you can help sea turtles? So I know sea turtles, it's really hard because sea turtles, um, they are endangered, they're federally protected. So they, there's laws and regulations. You can't touch a sea turtle unless you're an authorized personnel. So how can you help um, sea turtles? Well, there's so many ways to make a difference. Don't litter, keep the beaches and waterways clean. So we love to say, keep the beaches clean, flat and dark. So we wanna make sure that there's no trash, there's no holes and there's really, there's no lighting. So um, recycle, use reusable bags, don't intentionally release balloons. Keep a skin has, like I said, fill a bag, which is an amazing, amazing program. Um, they have stations all over the beaches where it, there's buckets for you to pick up the trash and throw away, which is really gonna help sea turtles. Um, if you're leaving the beach, fill in holes that you dig. If you're leaving the beach and you see a sandcastle and no one's around, make sure you knock it down. Don't knock someone's sandcastle over if they're building it, but if there's no one around, make sure the beach is flat. Um, stay alert when you're boating and raise awareness and educate others because this is how we're going to spread the word to really help sea turtles and help our ecosystem and our planet. Um, a little bit more, um, use sea turtle safe lighting. If you don't have sea turtle safe lighting, you can also turn off your exterior lightings where you can. So you don't need to have, a, if you don't need to have a ton of exterior lighting, we ask you that you do not use exterior lighting. Um, write to officials for sea turtle safe lighting in your area, in your municipality. There are lighting ordinances, um, so talk to code enforcement, see what your lighting ordinance is in your municipality. Keep it saying does a really good job with our sea turtle friendly lighting. Um, we want to see keeping it up and changing those lights to sea turtle friendly. The sea turtles are really going to thank you because it is one of the, it's 
very horrible to see during sea turtle season, all these disorientations and when they have a chance to make it and unfortunately they don't because of us. Um, if you do live on a beachfront property and at night, you could just close your blinds because that interior lighting actually does, it makes a huge difference because that interior lighting is shining. And if your windows are open and your curtains are open, it really shines and lights up the beach. So just keep your curtains and blinds closed if you live on a beachfront property. Um, if you do get the chance to see a nesting mother or um, a hatchling, which I, it's amazing, I, we just ask that you please stay back. Do not crowd around them. Um, please, they are very, very, um, fragile, they are, they spook easily, do not stress them out, we want to give them the best chance possible, so please stay back, like I said, don't um, crowd around them, if you're going to take a picture, please do not use flash photography, um, again, you cannot pick up or touch a sea turtle, um, if you do see, if you think that there's something wrong, um, if it's sick or going a little slow or a hatchling's going the wrong way, please call us right away. Um, we may not pick up, but please text us, call us, leave us messages. We will return your call right away as soon as we can. You are also, um, FWC has a stranding hotline, so you can call if you see a sick or injured sea turtle or something doesn't feel right, you can call us. So please, whenever you can, like if you see something going on, call us and we're actually going to tell you what to do, what the best thing to do is. So um, we may uh, say, because we can't get out there right away, so if a hatchling's going the wrong way, we'll tell you what to do. So just call us if you see anything, but we want you to enjoy that moment, but please make sure to stay back, don't cry around them. That also goes for sea turtle eggs. I know with king tides and hurricanes in Miami-Dade County, we do see, unfortunately, nests wash out and expose our eggs. So if you do see that, please do not touch the eggs. So the eggs are super vulnerable and they're embryos. So as sea turtle is growing, their embryos are actually attached to that eggshell. So any crazy movement is gonna detach that embryo and it's gonna kill the sea turtle. So we ask if you see an egg, do not touch it, send us a picture, call us right away, call FWC um, and we will get out there and do what is best for that sea turtle egg. So talking about citizen science, citizen science is incredible. So get involved with citizen science. Let's work together. Um, it is something that this ecosystem needs, that our planet needs. So wherever you can, whenever you can, get involved with citizen science. There's so many different things that you can do. Fill a bag, um, look up fill a bag. They're incredible. Help clean up the beaches. There's this Gain Bay Water Watch. There's a thousand eyes on the water by Miami Waterkeeper. If you have any questions about citizen science, please talk to Ramya or Bree. They're incredible. Um, the Cuba State Citizen Science Project. So get involved, start helping out where you can and really make a difference and really help this planet out. All right, so we're gonna go into questions. So I'm gonna hand it over to Bree. All right, so thank you, Leanne, for coming and giving that wonderful talk. Um, we had an immediate question following on Twitter um, who wanted to know more about how exactly you prevent uh, raccoon predation on nests, which I think is really cool having worked with you. Um, <laughs> and I think that a lot of people would like to learn more about because, you know, they smell the eggs, they go for them. Yeah. How do you as a sea turtle surveyor prevent that from happening? So we have, it's, it's incredible. Um, again, it's a natural process. So we don't want to mess up a natural process too much, but when we see it, actually really harming our nests, we step in. So here in Miami-Dade County, we have a specialized permit to what we do is called screening a nest. So what that means, it's called, it's a self-releasing screen. So it literally looks like a piece of wire um, fencing that we place over our nests. And we make sure that we know 100% that that egg um, chamber is covered by that screen. And we'll make sure that screen is um, laid in place and that stops the raccoon from actually digging into the nest. So it stops that little demon from getting those little hands in there and ripping up a screen and getting those eggs. Um, and we, the good thing about a self-releasing cage is once we put it on, it does not harm the sea turtles in any way. Um, and they actually can make it out on their own. We don't have to worry about it. They, we see 100% all of them making it out with this self-releasing screen. So, um, but 
noted, we don't have that in all areas. We only have that in areas that are highly predated by raccoons. It's a specialized permit. So we follow our permit guidelines into specific areas that we see these raccoons infiltrating our nests. So that's just for um, the person who asked the question who's still in our uh, lecture. That's something that we see very commonly on Key Biscayne, um, sp especially because bear cut is really bad for um, raccoon predation on sea turtle nests. And then I imagine they do the same in bill bags, but um, what was left out of this is that bill bags and the rest of Key Biscayne are managed like under two different permits because bill bags is its own permit. So I think they do stuff to prevent uh, raccoon predation, but yeah, Romeo would know more about that. Yeah, Bill Max has so, since the state, it has their own permit and their own rules. They actually do things the same as we do, but a little bit different because they are a state-run park, so. Yeah, it is It is very similar. I actually uh, volunteer with the Bill Bag Center. Oh, yay. So uh, yeah, they use the same kind of screens um, that are self-release that where the, the babies can get out. And, and yeah, I've seen like where you can see um, when you're checking the nests, the raccoon prints across the yeah. net start probing and it's surprising how far down through the screen they can stick their oh, little I know it's crazy they're they're smart and they're mischievous little things but luckily that screen really does prevent them even though they try it does prevent them from getting those hatchlings which is great so we have another question from Twitter and then I will turn it over to Ramya for questions from email. And uh, we, we have a tweet that says, hi, I am Ellie and four years old. Do you need a junior scientist? I want to help. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Well, keep looking on our Facebook and social media. We are really, really focusing um, this winter on outreach and education and we're really trying to up our projects and up our volunteers. So um, just keep looking at our social media pages and if you ever have questions and want to help out just email us and talk to us and we'll try and get you um, in with our program. Like I said our outreach and education portion of our program is really getting a jump start and we're really trying to um, just do different ways to get everyone involved. So just keep out with our social media pages and we'll try to get you to help out and become a junior scientist because we need everyone to help out. All hands on deck as it were. Yeah. And if Ellie uh, and family live on Key Biscayne, you can definitely help us. Um, I worked at the Sea Turtle Conservation Program as well, uh, briefly. So uh, you can definitely help out turtles by taking your trash with you when you leave the beach and also, you know, making every beach trip a beach cleanup. I do the same thing when I go to the beach. I know Leanne does the same. She's a good friend of mine. You know, <laughs> just trying to help make our world a little bit better. So, um, Great question. Looking forward to see you as a colleague in the future, Ellie. <laughs> um, I'm going to throw it over to Ramya, who's been monitoring our email for questions. Yeah, so um, um, just to add to uh, Ellie's question, um, you can actually um, do seagrass adventures with Biscayne Nature Center. Um, they, they do them for very young kids. Um, I think they didn't this year because of COVID, but I'm sure they'll start up again next summer. So that is something that you can absolutely get into. And the, if I'm not mistaken, um, it, again, it was suspended during COVID, but normally the sea turtle, the Miami-Dade Sea Turtle Conservation Program does um, hatchling releases in conjunction with um, Biscayne Nature Center. Is that right? Yeah, so we do, unfortunately this year we had to cancel our hatchling releases due to COVID, but typically um, during nesting season, we actually let the public come out with us um, and we do it at the Nature Center. Um, we do it at Friday nights at the Nature Center. Um, so you, you get to come, you get to have a presentation about hatchlings, about sea turtles, and then we actually show you the sea turtle hatchlings and you walk with us to the beach and you get to watch them get released. So unfortunately we didn't get to do it this year. So, but in the future, definitely um, be on the lookout because we do sell tickets for that event. And um, it's a really cool thing to see. And it's a really cool thing to actually get to see the hatchlings make it into the water and just see that process. It's amazing. So highly suggest it. <laughs> Okay, so I've got four questions um, in, from uh, email. Um, one of them, um, I'm not going to read names, 
But um, so one is, I was, I just got this one. I was so fortunate to be there when eggs were hatching. I was very careful about photos, but warned not to post on social media. My purpose was totally just to promote awareness. Why was there the rule not to post on social media? So social media is a very, very hard place when it comes to sea turtles and just anything in general. Um, people can take things a different way. Um, I'm not sure who she talked to, but typically when we um, are out on the beaches and you're taking pictures of us, sometimes we're not comfortable with that. So the person may ask you not to post it on social media if it's involving them um, just for their privacy. But if you get a chance to take a picture of a sea turtle, um, what happens is Florida Fish and Wildlife monitors sea turtle posting. So anything that might be of endangerment to a sea turtle, they could come after you. So sometimes it's in your best interest not to post it. But when it comes to social media, you're more than like, if you post a sea turtle picture, you just want to explain that if um, what you saw, you stayed back, you did not touch them. Um, there, or if you saw somebody that was an authorized personnel, say this was completed by authorized personnel. So it's just a very hard, fine line when it comes to social media because they are endangered. So it's really hard to make sure that when people are posting about sea turtles, they're doing the right thing. Um, if you do post in the future, you, uh, you can, uh, we can't stop you from posting. Um, we just ask that you will make sure that you're telling people and promoting sea turtle awareness and promoting that you are not touching them or doing anything illegal because they are federally protected. Great. Yeah, I know that um, whenever I have posted about sea turtle stuff in the past, I always um, included the permit number for Bill Bag. Right. That yeah. Doing work under. Yeah, if you're if you're involved with anything within our conservation program, we will make sure that you know our permit number and that you post it as well. Great. Okay, so um, uh, Florida has a lot of invasive species. Are there any predators that are introduced predators um, other than the, the natural predators that you talked about? That's a great question. Um, so for the most part, we don't see too much um, of anything other than the just natural that we see day to day that's actually cause um, problems with our sea turtle nesting. I mean, obviously with the raccoons, um, because of human impact, we're seeing a really heavy growth in their population because they're getting comfortable and they're getting fed by people. So but for the most part, for the invasives, um, we do actually see though in the dune systems, if there's an invasive plant species, um, sometimes the roots actually get into the egg chambers. Um, but for the most part, we it's nothing, we don't see, it's we don't see anything out of the ordinary here in Miami-Dade County. Oh, that's good. Great question. Yeah, great um, question. Okay, two more. Um, how long do they take to mature once they get into the water, the babies? Um, it depends. So sea turtles are, as much as we have, I say we, as much as Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation and researchers have studied sea turtles, they are very, very understudied. So actually the leatherback sea turtle, they really don't even know where they're mating, how they're mating. It's really not documented. Um, so their research is very, um, there's not much of it. So for um, maturity, it can be anywhere from 10 years to 30 years. It depends on species. Um, it's something like genetics is still an ongoing research. So it's really hard to give a solid answer when it comes to sea turtle maturity. Um, but typically what we, we usually give anywhere from 10 to 30 years. So it takes a long time for sea turtles to grow and actually reach maturity. And that's why another reason why they're, why they're so vulnerable and why their population is prone to crashing is because it takes so much time for them to mature. And like I said, only one in 1,000 actually make it to adulthood and it takes anywhere from 10 to 30 years. So it's really, they're very vulnerable. Um, so quick comment, um, Abby, who asked the first question about posting to social media responded and she said, excellent answer and fabulous presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, and then a uh, final question. Um, other than the, the um, citizen science programs that you mentioned, 
um, how can somebody get involved in sea turtle conservation specifically? So sea turtle conservation is, um, like I said, it's kind of hard because sea turtles are endangered, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean like Ramya said, Bill Bags has a volunteer program. So if you definitely want to see, uh, you can get in contact with Bill Bags. I'm not too entirely sure how their volunteering works. Um, again, because we are a different entity than they are. Um, for us, for sea turtle conservation, again, like we do not, we, our volunteer group is very tiny because our program is still um, on the ups. So uh, for sea turtle conservation uh, for Miami Dade County, it's really, just dependent on just keeping up with our social media, seeing when we need help or if we need help. Um, but that also for sea turtle conservation, you can go to rehab facilities. There are tons of rehab facilities in Florida, Boca Raton, Jupiter, they have rehab facilities that you can volunteer at. They have nesting surveys that you can volunteer at. So even though Miami-Dade County might not, um, or we're still working our volunteering program and with sea turtle conservation, there's other programs out there. Um, so definitely be on the lookout and type in volunteer work. So that's where you can um, get involved. Um, now, sea turtle conservation, like I said, is hard because you have to be on a permit to be touching or handling sea turtles, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can't help us in any other way. You can help us um, prepare for next season. We're hoping to get volunteers helping us like paint stakes and things that we really need for nesting season. So but again, just be on the lookout for us, for Miami-Dade County. Just be on the lookout on our um, social media for future volunteer options. But definitely look into other programs that have volunteers for um, sea turtle conservation because it is it's amazing. It's definitely something that you want to be a part of. So like I said, rehab facilities, build bags, um, look into that. And I'm sure if Ramya has any more comments about build bags volunteering, she can add to it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we started their program um, last year in 2019, and they have uh, two trainings, one where you uh, sit um, and they, they lecture you and, and you go through a PowerPoint and they teach you all about it. And then a second training that's in the field where you actually go and everybody excavates a sea turtle nest together. And the entire time you're working under their lead biologist, um, Elizabeth Golden, um, she's the, the permit holder for Bill Bags, I believe. And uh, so she makes sure that, you know, everybody is learning it correctly and, and doing everything right. Um, this year they did suspend the program again because of COVID-19 because it ruined everything. Um, and I was able to do it this year just because they did need a little extra help and I've already gone through the training. Um, so, so that's, I was able to stay with it this year, but they're hoping to reopen the, the, um, volunteer program again next year. So um, all you have to do is just contact Bill Bags. Um, I don't have their contact information with me, but it's easily found on Google. And you just shoot them an email or call their number and just ask, you know, about the, the sea turtle program for next year and, and uh, see what's going on with it. And like I said, they're hoping to be able to reopen it um, in the summer um, again. Um, and then, okay, so final question, and this is my question. Um, Leanne, how did you yourself get interested in sea turtles and get into sea turtle conservation? Well, uh, that's, um, so I actually, so I have, I started in the marine science world when I went to undergrad. I did a marine science bachelor, so a bachelor of science in marine science. Um, and then I was in the marine mammal world for a little bit. I was with sea lions and seals, um, and then I decided that I wanted to go and do more schooling and so I went into University of Miami to get my master's with the MPS program and I oh I've always loved sea turtles um and but I never actually really expected myself to be involved um speaking candidly I never thought I was going to be in this position I am now um but during my time at Rasmus at University of Miami I was given the opportunity to intern with Miami-Dade County um sea turtle conservation program and I ended up falling in love with it and sea turtles are an amazing species they are they've been around since the dinosaurs and we are still learning about them they're incredibly adaptive they adapt to their environment and adapt to their surroundings and we are still learning about them so it intrigued me so much that I ended up doing my master's thesis on sea turtles 
So, and I just, I kept going and I just keep learning about them and just want to protect them at all costs. So I, it definitely, it's crazy, like just how amazing these species are. And I just really interested me and it still interests me and in just learning about them every single day and doing everything and anything in my power to help this um, species and help this population grow and just help protect them because they really do need it. They, they can't, they can't tell us what they need. So we're out there. We're, it's just, well, I just fell in love with it. <laughs> Great. Great. Hey right, guys, um, that's our lecture for today. Thank you all for coming and uh, watching uh, Leanne and listening to Leanne talk about sea turtles. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, we are going to be picking up our lectures every month. Um, they will be every third Thursday at 7 p.m. And just keep an eye on our social media or the Islander News, um, and we'll be posting about upcoming lectures. Um, uh, again, if you have any other questions or if you want to get a hold of us for anything, um, you can, you know, follow us on social media, tweet at us, you know, send us a direct message in Facebook. Um, you can email me, you all see my email address. You know, any use our Instagram. We're happy to answer your questions. Um, I, you know, and just so you guys know, I have people that will send me pictures that they took at the beach and ask me what species of bird is this. Mm -hmm. We're, you know, we're happy to help with with anything that's, you know, science and biology and anything because, you know, we just we want everyone to learn and be interested and care about their environment. So. Thank you again, Leanne, and thank you, Brianna, for your amazing moderating today. And yes. uh, we will thank see you, you for having us. Thanks for having the Sea Turtle Program. We appreciate and love being a part of this. All right, thanks. All right. Thank you.